Hey friends, I'm Jess Connolly. I'm an author, a coach, a Bible teacher, and a local church leader, and I love talking to real people who know what it means to have full lives, but also want to walk in abundance. This podcast is for you. It's not my podcast, it's ours. It's for people who crave lighthearted conversations and deeply spiritual truth. It's for people who are busy, tired, waiting, growing, dreaming, working, or praying about what's next. Wherever you're listening from, if it's quiet, mundane, or busy, I am praying for you and I'm so glad you're here. Let's go. Is ambition a dirty word? I've had people call me ambitious as an insult, and I've had people praise me for it as well. I've looked at other women and coveted their dreams, their hustle, their desire, and also, if I'm honest, I've judged them, wondering what was driving them and assuming it had to be something unholy. Of course, I've had a hard time ignoring the fact that ambitious men are most often encouraged as they're seen to be great leaders or amazing providers, while many women are left being questioned for their motives and challenged to be more content. So, is ambition a dirty word? Is it biblical? Can it ever be kingdom-minded? I'm bringing my best friend, my sister, and one of the most driven women I know in for this week's episode. We'll make it our ambition to tackle this with all the humility, wisdom, and honesty we can muster. Let's go. This is what I say about you. I say, oh, you think my sister's nice? You have no idea. She's way nicer than you know. Oh, you think she's a good mom? You think she's pretty? You think she's successful? You have no idea. You are so much better than people think you are, and people think you're pretty great. So that's saying something. These are not words that I don't say too often. I hope you hear me say them often. I think you're the best mom I know. I think you are literally, there's no think. You are a genius. I would like to have your IQ tested. Your memory recall is phenomenal for one week. (laughs) (laughs) Let's be real. The long term no, is damaged, but short term, I can recite some quick. You are very, very, very intelligent. And people, if they mistake your high sense of fashion and your extreme kindness as being a lack of intellect, they are wrong because you're even smarter than you are nice, which is saying something. But this is another thing I say about you behind your back, that people who think I am a hard worker, I'm a sloth on a log. (laughs) (laughs) Compared to you. I am. I am. I mean, I'm fine with it. I don't care. But welcome, Katie Walters, oh my to the podcast. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's funny that you say that, though, because I don't think of myself as a hard worker oh at all. Oh, my and gosh. you know, and Josh, who lives with me all the time, is like, you're one of the hardest workers I know. And I'm like, really? You and Josh are the hardest workers I know. Like, maybe I, he, that's why he makes me feel. Maybe, because crazy. Josh, <laughs> when I say I don't know if Josh sleeps, like, does he? I mean... Yes, he does sleep, but not even close to as much as I sleep. That's the thing is that he really does require less. And I'm not saying you're bad at rest because neither of you are. Like you've got rhythms to sustain you, I'm assuming. Yeah. (laughs) I don't think of Josh as someone who is like striving or bad at abiding. Like I don't think that about him. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not saying he's a hard worker. I'm just saying I don't see him and he's not working really, you know? Yeah. But you same. Yeah. So- But I think one thing that's beautiful about you is that a lot of times it doesn't feel like trying. That's how you make it look. It doesn't look like you're like, got to get this work done. (laughs) (laughs) No. Well, it's it's interesting the other day, you know, I'm on part of that convene round table. Yeah. And this is just interesting in this topic is that the chair of the convene, there's not many chairs. It's a round table for like business business leaders and business business leaders. And The interesting fact is you have to have sold a business that's worth a certain amount of money to be a chair. Okay. So in the nation, there's only like two or three women chair of Kameen, but mine is a woman chair. And one day we were having coffee and she was like, I just think you need to celebrate the fact that you haven't lost your hair, that you're sleeping. Most women, as they do that, you know, there's other things that are giving and they are really struggling. And I thought, that's interesting that you would say that because I don't... The women owners I know, I would not say of them that that's true. I just feel like 
women in business in the last decade have been afforded some more wisdom about how to handle ourselves. Yeah. So like True. we're in a generation, we have shift. language about self care. We have books like tired of being tired, yes. you know, like we're yes. knowing how to take care of ourselves. We actually were talking about this in the office the other day. We were saying we were trying to think of like, basically like an avatar, somebody we could talk to. And we were like, do you know any like women in business who are tired? We were like, most of the women in business we know are really well boundaried and rested. Yeah. You I know, would, I would agree with that. For yeah. Sure. Thank God. Okay, we're talking about ambition. Mm -hmm. We have so many things to cover. We have scripture. We have cultural mm -hmm. references. We want to do TV, but I want to like do a deep rewind to why this word buzzes in our ears. It's uh -huh. really a story about you, but then it became about me in my own life. So will you tell was, the yeah. story? Okay, so now here's where I could be wrong. Three years ago, mm -hmm. something like that. It was a minute ago. So actually Josh and I were in an argument, a fight. And, and I'll say- you know, this was a river. If you've, if you're a married couple and you know that you constantly kind of find yourself in the same river of an argument, there's usually something behind that argument. And yeah. for us, one of the principles that we've done in marriage is if we find ourselves in kind of the same river, maybe different circumstances, then we'll get counsel around that. So we'll, so we call it fight in front of someone. Yeah. So basically we were going to fight in front of this counselor. So we unpacked this argument and this is where it's a little embarrassing to actually talk about the argument, but I'm just going to do it for yeah. any women listening. That's like, I resonate with that. So we serve at a church. I love our church so much. And at this point I wasn't, I didn't have a staff role at the church and we were putting on this huge conference. And part of the way that I was going to serve at that conference, which let's also say I had asked to do <laughs> to be a part of it and to serve at it was doing coffee and it back in the green room. Well, this was like going on my third year of doing that. And I just had higher hopes than that. I didn't really want to do the coffee job yeah. again. And so Josh and I had gotten an argument about this because I had so much passion around this particular week-long conference. And in a lot of ways, I wanted him to see what was in me and mm. want to fight for that. So we go to fight in front of this counselor. At some point he says, what would you like to do instead of serve? And I said, well, I mean, if you're really asking, I would like to be at least like teaching a breakout at some point. I feel like I have things to say, mm -hmm. things to offer. Again, guys, I'm just giving you the vulnerable raw. Of Which this is, argument. no, this, this, this is the conversation women are having. Yes. So yes, thank you. Guys. So it comes to this point. So as any great counselor would do, I would say he's looking for like, what is this conversation about? What is this fight about? What is underlying this mm -hmm. point of contention in their marriage? And in his mind, he drilled it straight down to ambition. And so he said, this is your problem. You're too ambitious. And then he also referenced the other members of my family that were too ambitious as women and one being me, one being you. And during that conversation, you know, Josh just kind of sat there mm -hmm. and then it turned somewhere to like, you're too ambitious and you don't spend enough time with God. Mm -hmm. You know, what happened to the girl that used to spend time with God? Which is crazy because you literally like live at the feet of Jesus. Well, I mean, I definitely am in his presence a lot, you know, in my mind. I would I say more than the average bear. Well, so I'm I, just saying. Josh is <laughs> just silent. So I look at Josh at this point, I'm like, you better tell him. You better, somebody better testify. Somebody better testify that I read my Bible <laughs> two hours a day. Every morning with the Lord. You know, whatever. You have so, a merry heart in a Martha world. Well, <laughs> like, you do. Please, somebody say. <laughs> anyway, so that's kind of where the conversation ended. Well, I come to you and we're talking about this conversation. And then that's the worst part about being a sister that you're like, gosh, I actually just offended my favorite person also, because we really talked it through though. We talked through like, what about that conversation was the truth yeah. that could have shifted or moved me? And what part was just used being used to wound yeah. and to like hurt? So if I remember, like, it's funny how your memory of a conversation is different, but like in my memory, which probably did not translate into reality, <laughs> In my memory, I was like, don't make it about you. 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 There was another person in the conversation whose name was also involved. Yes. And I remember looking at her face and knowing like, we are both trying to not to make not this make, about our, right. and you walked out. You left the conversation and we were like, are we too ambitious? Which <laughs> <Yes. laughs> is the worst part. I'm like, who assumes like, oh, they're not going to think this is about them at all. It's all about me. I, and, I'm sure in the moment uh, we actually probably did make it about ourselves more than we needed to. But I do no, remember did, trying to be like, didn't. oh, I'm so sorry this happened to you. Yes, let's help weigh it out for you. No, I mean, not at all. Like, 
offended that someone also just threw me under the bus too. But, and especially I remember thinking like, I don't even work hard as a two of you two. I'm the sloth. Right. <laughs> In your mind. <laughs> so true. Uh, so yeah, so that led us to this discussion of ambition and to really diving into scripture yeah. for ourselves, asking yeah. God. Yeah. And the interesting thing that we haven't talked about this, but I think if there are traps to, so basically in scripture where he says like, do not have selfish ambition. Yep. Do not have ambition for yourself. But in Philippians, he says, be ambitious about the things of God. 100%. So I think for both of us, when we are looking at it and asking God and repenting, yeah, is there any selfish ambition? Those are going to be really different. Like you yeah. can't look at all of women and say, they're just ambitious. You can't. This part of them is selfish and this part of them is ambitious for God. Yeah. So that's what we're going to get into. We're going to talk about the verses. We're going to get into the Greek a little bit, but I think that probably the most productive thing out of that conversation, I think, correct me if I'm wrong. I do feel like maybe it sent us out of that moment individually asking, how did we become like this? Yes. Yeah. And not in a way of blame or shame, but like what is behind this? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, here's where I want to make my first cultural reference, okay? But I want you to be thinking about, do you know your answer to that? Okay. What made you like this? Okay. Okay. I'm still working on mine, and I've okay. been talking to a therapist about it for three years. But here's my first cultural reference. Love it or hate it, like them or love them, whatever. You can be wherever you want to be. I watch the Kardashians. You know this. Mm-hmm. People who listen to the podcast probably know I'm a student of culture. I'm not saying that to be silly. I love pop culture. Yes, I love understanding true. what like the mainstream culture is saying about the kingdom. I think the Kardashians are fascinating on many different levels. I also think they're massively influential in culture. And so I think like understanding what they think about God and people is just interesting. I also cannot get on board with anybody who just writes them off as vain and silly specifically. Like they do a lot of things that are obviously like not kingdom related, but like Kim Kardashian alone with prison reform, like she is doing more for prison reform than like many civilians will ever do for the hurting so a vein of the last few seasons of the Kardashian show has been like, why is Kim so ambitious? Mm. And the other sisters and other people like attack her about it. They get in fights about it. And so here's what's interesting. I just want to make this interesting note. The past few seasons, she has been like defending herself. You know, she's gotten in trouble in the press for saying like, women should just get up and work. And she's kind of had this hard defensive tone like regarding her ambition, saying like, like, this is what I have to do. This is who I am. This is very recently on the like last two episodes of the Kardashian show, Keeping Up the Kardashians or Keeping Up, whatever it is on Hulu, the most recent one, Kim starts going to therapy. She's never been in therapy her whole life. Not after the Paris robbery, not after like divorce, not after, you know, all the things. So she's like, finally, I'm going to therapy. And she says that she's like, I am realizing that I kept going as a trauma response. And a lot of it for her is like in relation to this, this horrific Paris robbery that she lived through, like being held at gunpoint, thinking she was going to die. And even she, she goes on to say like, I've said that my superpower is staying calm under pressure. And that's kind of what I've used to, to Mm -hmm. like move my career forward is that I can, but she said, my therapist is helping me understand now that that is not a superpower. It's a trauma response. Yeah. And it's crazy. So she even go, it's actually beautiful. I'm not trying to advocate for watching the Kardashians if you feel like it would offend you, but it's actually beautiful because she repents to some degree. She goes to her sister who's been telling her she needs therapy and who has been saying like, I think your ambition is hurting you and other people. And she's like, you were right. Thank you for going first. She actually says, thank you for going first. And her sister, Courtney is like, you know what? I didn't handle it well. I was judgmental towards you. I should have let you had your own journey. I'm just like, if we could all grow with this amount of humility and they're doing it in front of millions of people. That's right. Now, that being said, I don't think it's always negative things that lead us to being ambitious. Right. So what do you think made you the way that you are? One thing that really helped me, I've told you this, but I had this because especially for us, like I do think that this father speaking especially from men, kind of getting these points along our life. Like when that wounding happened where it was like, it's because you're too ambitious. I think it came stronger. It came more stronger wounding because it was a male that I respected, a spiritual figure. Well, I also had this prophetic word 
for a male spiritual figure that spoke over me, did not know me at all. And he said, and I'll never forget it, but he said, she has a strong business yeah. gene. Yeah. It comes from her mother's side. Yeah. God wants to use that. And it, I don't know, it just, it helped me to say like, okay, there are some things in me that have been in me that are not a response to trauma, that are not escapism. Yeah. yeah. That is because God made me like that. Yeah. You know, he made me with this mind for economics and yeah. supply chains and goals. I was created like that, yeah. you know, with vision Yeah, as a visionary leader. So all that to say, I think just like you're saying, there are things that I do that are a response to different woundings that I've had yeah. that have probably pushed me forward. One of mine, I think, is the futuristic planning. And I think I do often do that as an escape mechanism for yeah. the present moment pain. So is that response a part of the ambition that I'm constantly thinking like, what's next? Where am I going next? What new mountain am I taking? You know, yes. Do I have mm-hmm. to really lay that down before the Lord and yeah. recognize that he has promised me today? Yeah. He has drawn the boundary lines in good places for me today. Yeah. My life is not promised to be up and to the right. You yeah. know, do I have to lay that piece of selfish ambition down that maybe wants to escape? Yes. So all that to say, I think there's like, for me, there's different components. Do I think that there's this huge wounding in me that I'm looking to perform to meet other people's approval? I don't really think so. Yeah. You know, I've only been in therapy. You I don't know, think you are past either. Year, so. I don't think you are. I don't think so. And and that's where I think for each woman, it is so complicated and so tricky. The stuff that they have to lay down actually before God, that is yeah. a piece of wounding that he wants to speak into and heal. And I think it's different for each person. So when I look at you, because I should be the expert because I was there when the deep magic uh-huh. was formed. Yes, like, you, you know were. what I'm saying? <laughs> like it was never out of brokenness. Yeah. I think about your like limited two outfits in you. fifth, sixth, seventh grade. I think about you like getting excited about decorating your room with a million sunflowers. I think about you like replaying the shoot. What was that band? Suck it in, suck it in if you're in 10, 10 oh, yeah. Over and over again. <laughs> what is that song? Oh my gosh, I don't the know. The hook brings you back. I think it's called it's The called Hook. It's called The Hook. I think about you replaying that song a million times to memorize the entire rap. Right. It's not really a rap, but. Here's one interesting thing. Do you remember that I was in DECA? Yes. Yeah, well, I did not get to compete because I skipped school. Yeah. And mom wouldn't like bail me out on it, which I'm grateful for to this day. But sometimes when I think about ambition, I think like, honestly, the most holy thing I do sometimes is stay. Yeah. Stay faithful to what God's put inside of me instead of escaping, skipping school and enjoying the day. Yeah. You know, oftentimes like the rest, the escape, the, you know, I just want to love and enjoy my life is not the holy path that he's called us to, you know? So there are things like that from growing up that do make me, you know, now again, there's other woundings, but I think there is pieces of it that. I think you're a natural born leader and cultivator. And I think that was in you from the beginning. I think that's who God made you to be. Okay. I have three tent poles of why I think I'm like this. Okay. One bad, one neutral, one good. Okay. Okay. The good one is since the moment I met Jesus, I've been obsessed with helping other people be as obsessed with him as I am. I really do think that drives me. Like there is a part of me that is like, I want everybody to feel this way. And like, I've felt that in my gut since I was 15. Mm -hmm. I want people to feel joy. I want people to feel abundance. I want people to feel mission. I want people to feel at ease. I don't like when people don't feel the good things of God. Yes. I think that's the good thing. And I do think that that drives me. The neutral thing, I would call this neutral, but it could be negative or positive. If I'm being honest, a lot of what drives my ambition is finances. Yeah. And I tell people all the time, I don't care about money. I really don't. Like, I, I think you know this about sure. me. Like, I don't care about having a ton of money. I drive yeah. a Honda. Like, I don't care about people thinking I have nice things. I don't care about people thinking I have money. I care about safety. Yeah. And I think 
that may be some wounding or it may just be who I am. I think it, it also just might be who I am. You know, that seven primal questions. I'm really into mm-hmm. that book by Mark yeah. Foster. It's basically like a different version of the Enneagram, but my primal question is like, am I safe? Mm-hmm. And they say like the question you're always trying to answer is also your superpower because you're good at answering that for other people. For sure. So I think I like making other people feel safe. Yeah. So I think a lot of what drives me in business is I want to feel safe and I want my kids to feel safe financially. Yeah. And I would say that's neutral. It could be negative. It could be positive. Mostly it's just true. The negative one, and I don't know if it's even negative, but I think it mostly comes out in brokenness is that for whatever reason, and I really do mean this for whatever reason, because we're talking about our childhoods. Like, I don't think anyone ever told me this. I just think I was kind of born into this like feeling of I'm not good at things. Yeah. And so when people tell me I'm good at something, I really want to do it. When people ask me why I write books, I'm telling you it is because I won the fifth grade dare writing award. And I thought, you think I'm good at that? I will not stop. I was telling my friends, I know, (laughs) but I was telling my friends like even today about going to pottery, Mm -hmm. going to pottery class and (laughs) <laughs> like I will never stop going to pottery class now because I was there for 30 seconds and the teacher walked over and was like, you're really good at this. Yeah, I swear I'm not. I looked at the pictures, like Nick made something way better than me, but people don't talk to me like that. Yeah. And so for throughout, throughout the rest of the class, people were like actually doing a good job. And she'd be like, but you're not as good as Jess. I don't know if <laughs> she just thought I needed a win. <laughs> <laughs> but so she much. can have all my money. I'm joining a membership. Like I just crave just, affirmation. Yes. So when you tell me I'm good at something, I'm not going to stop doing it. Okay. You know, I have two big thoughts about that. <laughs> One's just specifically related to you. The second one, hopefully it could encourage a listener and you, but that's 100%. Even you think about naptime diaries yeah. and graphics and, you know, when I would walk into your homes and be like, how can you do this? How can from nothing you create the most beautiful calendars and all of that? And then I feel like you just kept working that muscle, you know, anytime yeah. it was affirmed. And yeah. I think there's so much beauty in that pain for you because I'm like, I've been telling you your whole life, like, did you know you have the most beautiful face of anyone that ever walked the <laughs> earth? And you're like, <laughs> so I'm always like, your face is just so incredible. Oh, yes, and so I'm like, I wish you would, you know, have taken that one and run with it. Then like put me on a book cover, which is what I always tell you. I'm like, I want to see your face on the front of a book. Okay, it's on a book cover. But the second thing is so interesting is yesterday I was talking to a person on my team and I had woken up praying for her and was journaling about this season of motherhood that she's in. She's just had another little baby. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the Lord told me she doesn't feel competent. Yeah. And she's lacking confidence. Yeah. And she's not gonna enjoy it if she doesn't feel competent. And I think about your season of motherhood and how there was a lot of it that I feel like in those early years, you just didn't feel competent. Yeah. So you lack confidence. Yeah. And then you started to think like, I'm not a good mom. I'm not good at anything. I'm never going to work again. That's the stuff that like breaks me because for whatever reason, when I had toddlers, those early toddlers... I just didn't have any expectations. I was 20. And you were killing it. Well, I wasn't. Like, you in a, in your the girls were always, way. you were, you were, your girls always had like really cute bows and they had really cute nurseries. And like, you were doing the things that like, say like, this is a good mom, but you're right. In those years for my kids, I was like, this is impossible. Yes. It was bad. Uh, truly what we can look back now and say is like, I just wasn't made to be a homemaker. Exactly. Like I wasn't great at it. It It was was overwhelming to me. I wasn't great at it. I didn't thrive in it. Yes. Like, but that I spent so many years doing that in like kind of formative years of my adulthood, plus being in a toxic church that said women couldn't be in ministry or work right? or work in my church. Women, the church we were at in our early twenties, women were not allowed to earn money. That was considered sinful. So I was like, I'll never work again. I'll never do anything again. And I suck at this one thing that is the only thing I'm supposed to do. And I don't super like thrive making my own bread. I was a proud (laughs) wife before it was cool and I was bad at it and I didn't enjoy it. Yes. yes. And you are, you thrive in routine. You know, you think about that season for me, I'm dropping kids off at 7 a.m. I'm working. It's a teacher. I love dropping kids off. Yes. So on Saturdays when I'm sitting out on a blanket and 
painting with them, it looks like, wow, she's such a good mom. Yeah. When actually I was just more in the lane of the routines that I needed in that season. Yeah. So I just say that for every season comes with places of incompetence. And instead of like making these defining moments of I'm not good at that role, yeah, maybe the most gracious things yeah. we could do to ourselves is to say like, hey, actually I was created for this role, but maybe not in this way. Because what's interesting now is I love homemaking. Totally. My favorite thing to do is laundry now. I know. You're, I know. I love to do laundry. You're, I literally, like Nick always asked me like, what was the best part of your day? And I'm like, babe, I got to tell you when I'm straight momming, I love it. I love carpool. I love yes. making a grocery list. Yeah. I love it. But it's also because I know I don't have to be like stellar at it from the world's perspective to love it. Absolutely. And you can see that wow. that's a great value add for your family because you were made to do those routines yeah. in this way. And like the same for me, throwing off, like, you know, I just hired a house manager. I started so training her today. But like for me, when I come home, I want to go and get on a kayak at five o'clock. Yeah. I want to be outside with my kids. So I need to supplement some of those traditional wife homemaking responsibilities to be able to do that. To do the magic But we all need freedom, right? Yeah. To like step into those places of competency. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the counseling session. No, don't be sorry. And you served me very well. I hear from people all the time that getting time in God's word and really soaking in God's word is difficult, that it's hard to incorporate into your schedule. And I get it, but I have an incredible solution for you that has helped me and so many other people. And that is the Dwell app. Again, Dwell helps us fight this huge problem because when we don't have time to sit down and read, we can listen to God's word. As we're driving around town, as we're preparing meals, as we're folding laundry, as we're going on walks, Dwell helps us absolutely soak up God's word. Here is why I'm obsessed with the Dwell app. You can not only pick different plans and different parts of the Bible to listen from, but this is also a listening app where you have so many different options. You can pick which version of the Bible is reading to you. You can pick which voice. I have to say my favorite is Ryan. You can pick which sounds you hear in the background. Maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's the ambient sounds. And again, of course, you can pick the content of which plan and you are going to be listening to of God's word. The Dwell app has helped so many people, including me, get time in God's word, and they are giving you guys a discount of 25% off. So you can go to dwellapp.io slash Jess to get 25% off of the Dwell app. You are going to love it. You are going to love soaking in God's word, living your day more connected to his truth, his presence, his power. I can't wait to hear how it changes the game for you. All right, let's talk about some of the verses. Because okay. people are like, what about, what about, what about? Know. Let's start with First Thessalonians 4. Mm-hmm. Do nothing so out of selfish the, ambition. That one's that? No. make it your ambition a lead to quiet life. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. I will say what's interesting to me is I had another one of like those, like your body goes cold, room grows cold, what's happening here moments just recently in seminary. I don't think my professor's going to listen to this, but if he does, hey, Joey, you're so smart. And he was teaching us on First Thessalonians, and he said... Okay, let's read this verse and make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. And you're going to think this is so interesting, Rubes, because we're in this room of like 20 women. I'm in a women's leadership cohort. So it's all women who are in leadership in some capacity in seminary. One man in the room, poor Joey, we have put him through the ringer of this week of seminary. And this was our last day of class. And he was like, so what's interesting about this verse, everybody? And we're like, we don't know, Joey, you're the expert. And he says, because like, there's such dichotomy here. Like, you know, ambition is like really actually like pretty unholy. And the air went thin and he was like, I think I just lost you guys. Or maybe he said something else, but he noticed. And he was like, I think I lost you somewhere here. I was like, well, and I had not talked a lot that week, which is rare for me. In fact, I had not talked so much that at one point during the week, Joey was like, are you with us, Jess? Like, are you here? And I was like, I am. I'm just going through a really hard time. I can't talk a lot this week. And so my like hand goes up and I'm like, well, I think a lot of us might struggle with what you just said because we've been told that our ambition is unholy, but we don't totally agree. Mm -hmm. And because the difference between 
you and us is that like really your ambition is rewarded and ours is questioned. Mm. So like, and you just kind of say, and he was like, oh, absolutely. And he was great. He was like, let me pause. Let me acknowledge my privilege that as a man, I am encouraged for my ambition. But he was like, but so let's like pay attention to like what we're saying when we say that. And so then we got Mm. into the Greek. And so all that being said, that word that is often translated as ambition in the New Testament is a Greek word, erytheia. And it means like, selfish gain, self-interest. Mm-hmm. A lot of times, like in relation to rivalry, feuds, and factions. Wow. But when we make that synonymous with the word ambition, that could in our English language mean like passion or drive or dedication, we write like yeah. circle it up as just absolutely broken and wrong. And do you know what's so beautiful about that? What? You know, if it's meaning rivalry, refute, all this stuff. So when I took that verse to the Lord about probably two months ago and was journaling through it, I had this picture of this couple in my neighborhood that I just felt like, make it your ambition to live a quiet life. Yeah. Like I kind of pictured them. I took that to the Lord and he's like, no, we're not doing that. You're not using this person as a comparison for a quiet life. And then he started to show me, do you know what a quiet life is? Is you are not gossiping. You're not sticking Come your on. nose in other people's business. Come on. You're not going around accusing people of stuff. You're not judging Come people on. of stuff. Like Woo. you are doing it. Woo. You know. Say it. And so I didn't even know what the Greek word meant. Well, just FYI. So it just is a comparison. In First Thessalonians 4, that's not what the Greek word means. That word for it, like make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. That means like be zealous, strive eagerly. It's the other verses like Philippians 2, 3, do nothing out of selfish, selfish ambition. ambition. That is not two words. First of all, in the Greek, it's one word that means like self-seeking. Selfish ambition, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So then we think it's the same thing as this godly ambition, this zeal, and it's not. It's two totally different words, two different root words. Like they're just massively different words. Anyways, we could just talk about this forever, but I think that's so interesting. And I, you know, I actually like removed every trace of it from the internet because I think there's probably pretty bad things in it. But I don't know if you remember this. I'm going to assume you don't, but I actually wrote an ebook before I ever traditionally published called Be Quiet and Say Something based on a little bit of like a lot of different verses in the New Testament, but about basically that idea that we can lead quiet lives and have something to say. No, but it's pretty- Can you resurrect it? I found it one time and it's pretty messed up. There's a lot of messed up things. (laughs) (laughs) I did not really know how to interpret uh, scripture in any way, shape or form, but I would like to rewrite it at some point. But all that being said, I think it's just helpful to identify there's selfish ambition in scripture and there's holy godly ambition. There's holy godly ambition. Oftentimes, you know, I was telling you this earlier, but the most godly thing partnering with him is to get these things out of us that he has planted inside of us. Like, yeah. So to me, when I think about godly ambition, that's what I think about, like dreams that he's planted specifically in you that need to come out, come on. you know? And then are we even living fully awake and whole and yeah. our most vibrant self to come show on. up and serve others and add value to others if we don't get these things out of us, you know? Yeah. Okay. I think I've actually used this metaphor before. And I'm not sure it makes sense in anybody else's head except for mine, but you know what I think about when we're talking about this and- I think we can start to like circle the wagon here about like, and how do we take care of ourselves? And like, how do we cultivate this in our daily lives? But I think about gymnasts, you know, the Olympics are on right Mm -hmm. now, which by the way, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to watch at all, any of the gymnasts, but apparently they're killing it. Oh my goodness. Did you watch them? It's only Simone. I haven't watched her yet. You have to watch that documentary. I Okay. I've got to. Okay. Well, this is what I think about gymnasts. You know, have you ever heard that if like one of the most dangerous things they can do is not go full out? No. Like one of the most dangerous things they can do is bring like three fourths to a stunt yeah. because that's how they get injured. Like they're so much less likely to get injured if they're going full out. Yes. Because even when they fall, then they're going to like, you know what I'm saying? So that's what I think I would say about this season in my life is that 11 years into church planting, I'm seven years into the leading go and tell gals, this will be our seventh year. I'm however many books in, 17 years into parenting, and there is an invitation, I would say, from the enemy of my soul to be caught up in the maintenance of it 
and to stop saying the wild ambition, to stop saying, I want to see the renewal of the American church. I want to be on the front lines of that. I want to see people go from death to life and life to abundant life. I want to see people get saved. I want to see them get healed. I want to see captives get set free. And the enemy is like, you could, or you could just be in this and be about maintenance. Oh my goodness. Yes. And same with go and tell gals. I think I could be like, let me just shift into a down gear. We've got a good system. We know how to make some okay graphics. And instead say like, actually there are women across the U S and across the globe and no one's equipping them. And they're Mm -hmm. sitting at home Mm -hmm. scared and God's inviting them into things and giving them calling, but nobody's stewarding them. And we could go find them and call them up and equip them. Yeah. Okay. Most interesting thing I'm going with that on the gymnast analogy. Mm -hmm. So the most dangerous thing they can do is to not go full out. Well, the Simone documentary is fascinating because it goes through 2020 in Tokyo. So if you, anybody who doesn't remember this, because I didn't until I watched the documentary, but she gets to Tokyo, all of this crazy pressure. I mean, every airport she's in, the entire Olympic banners is just Simone Biles, you know? So basically all of the Olympics is riding on her. Now they've been in quarantine for a year. It's the first Olympics or competition of her entire life that her mom and family are not there. She's in a mask you know, has only been in the gym. They have no community. She does it in front of an empty arena, lights everywhere, nobody's in there. It's so terrifying and sad. Well, the best thing about this documentary, and I think her as an incredible, you know, strong woman that we all can learn from is that she does that first vault. It's the Biles. I mean, she's crafted now five moves that are only hers. It's just insane, her, her skill level. But anyways, she goes to do this first vault and she the way she describes it is she gets lost in the air. And she says she's had glimpses of this all through practice where she's having these trauma responses where she doesn't know where she is in the air. And it's terrifying and devastating because you're one move away from, you know, paralyzation, anything when you don't know where you are in the air. And so she does the first vault. She ends up not doing two twists and a half. She does one in air and then she falls on the vault. She comes off and she says, I just start thinking to myself, how am I going to tell them I'm not doing anything else? It's over for me right now. Like I cannot physically do this. Because she'll kill herself. She'll kill herself. Literally. Something is happening in my brain and I'm off and yeah. she knows it. And they Dang. say, you have to be like the greatest of all times, a world renowned athlete to be able to listen to yourself 100%. in that moment. 100%. So she calls it the whole Olympic, Olympic. She never comes back. So she gets back home. So what is her ambition there to live a quiet life? She starts going to therapy. She's going back to the gym once or twice a week and just jumping on the trampoline. And girl can do more on a trampoline than anyone in the entire world at 25 years old. Most of these, you know, gymnasts are done at 20, but she knows what is inside of her. So does she hang it up? She's getting married. Her husband's an NFL star. She's supporting him, going to see it on the weekends. And she just knows like- I have to end in a different way. Like there's more inside of me than this. I need to work on my inner life, my inner voices to not have these trauma responses, but then I've got to get this out of me. And it's just the most incredible picture. Of course, she just went to 2024. She won a million golds, you know, and, and has led the U S team to like the victory. I mean, they just won gold. You at the whole team, but all that to say, I just think about that. You saying that I need to go full out. So I think for women, if you really want to take your ambition to the Lord and check it, because you're not going to know a hundred percent of the time, is this godly ambition? Is this selfish ambition? But if you can know number one in this season, what does full out look like for me? Where are my set lines and boundary places that he's drawn for me? And then number two, Check your thought life. Do not Where get lost am in the air. I in the air? If I am comparing, looking at others Come on, on social media, constantly striving, even for me with that argument with Josh, am I making my dissatisfaction his fault? Yes, I was. Mm. That is lost in the air. Yeah. I got to take that to the Lord. Yeah. You know, if you're in a season of motherhood that it's like, I wish I could do this, write the book, speak at the conference and it, you know, whatever. Can you take that to the Lord? Don't get lost in the air. Yeah. Do full out that season, but no, there are things inside of you that need to come out. Come on. And it's not called just like, you know, self-care it does not mean that we just sit around and think about only ourselves on. all the time, you know? Yeah. 
So I just think that's such a good analogy of full out and then also being able to really listen to our thoughts and yeah. know, okay, what is tripping me up? Yeah. What am I thinking about? And I think a lot of times as women, when we have this conversation, we want other women to like answer it for us. We want people to say like, okay, well, what does it look like when it's selfish? And I just want to say in the name of Jesus, if you have access to the Holy Spirit, you know. A hundred percent. You know when you're making it about you. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever heard me coach in any capacity, you might know what I'm about to say. And that's this. Don't not get on the vault because you're scared you're going to make it about you. Because then the enemy wins and people don't get served. Get on the vault. Use your God-given gifts. Yeah. Start jumping. And when you make it about you, repent. Because then... Like do a Kim Kardashian and say like, oh, you know what? This was wrong. That's right. And let people see you repent. Totally. Like or this was me working for approval or yeah. this was, you know, this was me making it about my dream and my name. That's right. And, but don't think that you need other people to tell you where the lines are because you have access to the Holy Spirit and you will know not anyone else in your life. Like right. other people might look at your ambition and say, she's making it all about her. What is, what is even her motives? What does she want here? And they might be dead wrong. And then let me tell you the scary side of this is other people might be, look at you and be like, oh, she is out for God's glory. And really what you want is your, your own. So you actually have to get with Holy Spirit every single day and say, search me That's and right. know me. And at the end of the day, you'll know because everything that is about your own glory is going to burn. Totally. Totally. So you'll know, you'll know, you'll, if you feel empty and you're living the dream, it's not about God. Yes. I think one of the easiest way for me to do that with the Lord is sometimes I sit in my living room and I just ask him what burns. Come on, show me what burns. And I think he wants to do that. He yeah. wants us to see like, this part doesn't not matter. Yeah. This part is all going to go away, you yeah. know? And he will give that to each person in their individual season yeah. and in the kindness of God. And he can handle it. I mean, that's the other thing is I'm like, God asks us to partner with him with all kinds of mixed impure motives all the time. Yeah. Because why? He's going to get his work done. Yeah. Like he can handle it. He can handle our selfish ambition and in kindness help lead us to a more God glorifying place. Oof. Okay. I want to end with this last question that was your idea. And then I want you to pray for us. Okay. Okay. You said before we started, Hey, we should share songs that pump us up. Oh my goodness. Get us in our feels about our godly ambition. And I'm going to tell you mine based on what we just said. Okay. Cause I don't think, you know, I don't even know if you've ever heard the song. I listen to it one time a week. And then I usually listen to it before I speak. It is the most random song. It's <laughs> by The Swell Season. The Swell Season is this duo that has not existed for like 15 years. Glenn Hansard, and I think her name is Ingrid. I'm not sure what her last name is. And they were once a couple, and then they broke up, and they like are from Europe, and nobody knows about them at all. Except for if you do know about them, if you know, you know. Um, <laughs> and there is this song called Say It To Me Now. And it is on the Swell Season Extended Version. It is the weirdest live recorded song ever because if you listen to it, they kind of don't record the guy, Glenn Hansard, who's singing. They kind of record just his guitar and this like very basic drum beat, maybe on like a djembe or maybe on like the side of the guitar. I can't even tell. And then just a little bit of the crowd, but his voice isn't recorded. Anyways, I listen to it one time a week and that's on Friday when I cold plunge at Ethos. And my friend Dom, who leads my cold plunge, knows it. And he knows like, usually it's the second time I plunge and he's like, say it to me now. And he knows it. He's like, I know I have to turn it down at the end because at the end the crowd starts screaming and that's all you can hear. But this is why I'm telling you it relates to what we just said, because basically it's Glenn Hansard probably talking to a lover, but I kind of sing it to God. And he says over and over again in an almost growling scream, <laughs> if you have something to say, say it to me now. And that's what I say to the Lord, like, especially before I teach. Like, wow. if you have something to say, you say it to me now. And like, if there's anybody else who could do this, you put them up there right now. And I don't want to do any of this if you're not in it. Like, if you have something to say, you say it to me now. I do it once a week on Fridays on my Sabbath just to kind of like wow. ring it out and be like, what do you want? I'll do it. That makes me feel godly ambition. Oh my gosh. I love you so much. That's <laughs> so good. I don't think I've ever said that to Lord. If you have something to say, say it to me now. 
I, I don't know if I have, and I just love that. He says, I'm scratching out the surface now. I'm trying hard to work it out. So if you have something to say, say, say it, it to me, me now. now. I love your growl and personality. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. It's so great. God's made us all so unique, yeah. and I just love it. So yeah. Okay, so I have a not deep one and a deep one. I want to hear them both. Okay, well, my deep one is This is the Hour by Christy Nichols. Have you ever knuckles? I, I do not knuckles. know any Christian music. I've really okay. got to work on it. You, I love this. This is just like, I love this song. It's to me, it's about the mercy of God, reconciling people to the mercy Oof. of God, which that's like my passion point is just, you know, you want to be reconciled, you want to help reconcile others to what you were reconciled to. And when yeah. you say, like, I was obsessed with God, He changed me, He transformed me, which yeah. He did. Yeah. And for me, I feel like I just am marked by His mercy from yeah. the moment, you know, that I came in relationship with Him. And so my mission and passion is for people to be reconciled to that merciful God. And this is the hour is all about that. But it's also for somebody like me who is Enneagram 7, future focused, can escape. Yeah. It's very much like you have today. And there will be a point Come when on. the prodigals are called home. Come on. Like myself. And so we give him today, you know, and then we are gone also. Whenever I'm in Shabasana every day. Yeah. I, whenever I finish the thing, I just truly pretend like that's it. Like what if I was taken out in a coffin today? That will help you know what Come will on. burn. Like it could be today, you know, but okay. So then my fun one or my not fun one that I listen to multiple times a week, I'm embarrassed wait how hear. much time is Dolly Parton's nine to five. Oh, and the reason yes. why you shouldn't be embarrassed. It's the best. Well, I'm embarrassed of how much I listen to it. My kids are like, oh my goodness. But the thing I love about that song is it makes me feel like work is fun. Yeah. And she's not saying it like that, but no. she's so fun. Yes. And I think about childhood and playing school and playing office and creating videos with you or like the stuff that yeah. I wanted to do my whole life. Yeah. And so I just think about it like work is worship and work is fun. Come on. And then there's some of it that's like you just straight got to stumble out of bed and get there with that five o'clock coffee. If you're right. going to do it. If you're going to do it. If you're going to do it, you, you got to be ready for the 5 a.m. club, you know, in I some seasons. So. I like it. Anyways, I love that song. Wow. I like you. I love oh, your ambition. I like you too. I love your ambition too. Mm. I'm, I love doing life with you and playing with you and laughing with you and resting with you. I also like not being ambitious. And together. hearing that you love pottery and thinking like, I hope I never have to touch a pottery thing. Like I just <laughs> love how different people are. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Will you pray for us? Yes, just anybody absolutely. who's wrestling with their own godly and mm -hmm. ungodly ambition. Lord, we love you. I thank you that you have created each one of us so unique and wonderfully made. And I just speak that over all of us today. I don't think we can hear that enough, that we are wonderfully made yeah. by you. We have been created with unique gifts and passions and dreams and desires and even things that drive us. Lord, I know that you had a hand in all of that. And so we just say thank you. We thank you for loving us that much that you foresaw us and that you foresaw this moment in time for us to be born into this specific generation, how blessed we are that it's this space and time that you've given us. And Lord, we also just come before you in a spirit of repentance and mm. humility and humanity yeah. to say that, my goodness, do we get it wrong so often? And do we just seek our own pleasures and really selfish ambition, Lord, that whatever is driving us is about us and not about others and not about your glory. Lord, we just tell you that we are so sorry for that. But I just ask that right now, just a spirit comes over each and every person that they have this very clear understanding that you can handle us, that you love us, wow. that it is because of the mercy of God, that on our best day, when we are ambitious for the things of you and your glory, and on our worst day, none of us are righteous, not one of us. We are only made righteous because of your son that you sent him to walk and live the perfect life that he could get after it in so many ways for others only. And we just thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the life that he lived. And may we continue to look to him, the author and perfecter of our faith. We love you in your name. Amen. Amen. Friends, I'm so grateful you listened to today's episode. Thanks for spending time with me. 
it would mean the world to me to connect with you. So you can send me a DM on Instagram at Jess A. Connolly or head to my website, JessConnolly.com for more ways to connect. If you have a minute to subscribe and leave a review of the podcast wherever you listen, it would massively help us reach more people with the good news that they can live fully awake. Let's go. Let's go.